question. The question before the House is, notwithstanding the governor's veto, shall HB 455 become law? The chair recognizes our last speaker, the member from Hampton, Representative Cushing. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The first time I stood up in front of this body and asked the House to abolish the death penalty, my five-month-old baby daughter, Grace, was sitting in her mother's lap, my wife Christie's lap, in the front row of the gallery. And as the speaker was preparing to bring up the bill, I looked up at her. And in a way, I think that helped me get up out of my seat and speak about capital punishment. The position I was taking at the time was different than the position that my governor, the same party, had about death penalty. My governor wanted to expand it, and I thought we needed to repeal it. And I was under, believe it or not, a lot of pressure from some of my colleagues not to speak. I woke up the morning of the vote uh, when the House was to take it up and read in the newspaper um, a suggestion from one of my Democratic colleagues that I not talk about the death penalty that day. But um, for some reason, I think because my daughter was up there, I realized I thought about my, grand, my father, her grandfather, who she never knew, my, grand, my father who was murdered, and I felt a need to speak and be his voice. Um, and while I had fear here on the floor, looking up at her, I had hope and decided to follow my hopes instead of my fears. I was happy, well not happy, but after I spoke in, op in support of repealing the death penalty, I found myself um, comforted by some interesting colleagues from across the aisle who shared my position on capital punishment. And I know for the past 20 years, this has been an issue that has cut across political divides. And I, I think of my friends like Lauren Jean and Bob Rowe and Kathy Souza, Kevin Avard, John Sprowski, people who have been stalwarts on this and, and, and really helped sustain us as we tried to do this important work. And I know that I say that to people because I realize that this is a complicated issue and for some people are wrestling with that conflict between, you know, what one's party is doing, what one's leader is doing. And I, I have to say, I have respect for the governor. I respect the office. I respect him as a person. And I'm sure that he, like all of us, has wrestled with this issue of the death penalty. And at the end of the day, we just have come to different conclusions about this issue. And we'll find common ground on other issues. But I would hope that at the end of this day, um, when we leave this chamber, we are good as friends and colleagues. Five days ago, my, I, I watched my then, my once upon a time, five-month-old daughter walk across the stage and graduate from college. And I couldn't believe what happened, and it seemed like just in a blink of an eye, 22 years had gone by. And as I was sitting at the convocation, I was remembering the first time I ever had Grace at a graduation ceremony, and it was, it was for her first birthday. Six months after I first spoke in opposition to death penalty here, my wife and I took her for her first birthday to Cambridge, Mass, uh, along with her sisters, to watch Nelson Mandela receive an honorary degree. And I had a flashback of holding my daughter in my arms up so she could see Nelson Mandela, and there's something about being in the presence of that man that fills one with awe. He was a guy who knew something about the death penalty because he'd faced it one time for inciting opposition to the racist apartheid regime in South Africa. He didn't receive it, but he spent 27 years in prison. When he got out, he didn't look back in anger. He had work to do. He had to free a nation from the burden of apartheid. He went on to become the president of a new South Africa, a South Africa that as one of its first acts abolished the death penalty. 
that afternoon of, of this ceremony, there was a musical song that was played for him. It was Amazing Grace. Some of you know it. And I thought how appropriate that song was for Mandela and perhaps how appropriate that song is for us today. Amazing Grace was written by a man named John Newton, who was a slaver, somebody who took human beings from the African continent and transported them here to the New World. He was a man by his own admission was responsible for the death of scores of innocent human beings. In a different time, in a different place, John Newton would have been strapped on a gurney had a needle put in his arm and poison pumped into him to kill him in retribution for the murders he committed. But as fate would have it, he did, that didn't happen. Instead, he went on to have a change of heart, changed his way. He became an opponent of abolition, spent the rest of his life fighting that evil institution. And he wrote a poem and he gave us these words that some of us remember. It was autobiographical, but it applies to everyone. It was like, I, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And that song that I was, I was holding my daughter Grace, listening to Amazing Grace, uh, being sung for Nelson Mandela, really stuck with me tonight, last night as I was thinking about what I was going to say today. You know, for 185 years in this chamber, we've been talking about the death penalty. Governor Badger walked out from his old office, what used to be in the interim, in 19, 1834, and brought a message to this body asking us to repeal capital punishment. We certainly know that we've had an extensive debate about it. The death penalty doesn't work. It doesn't work for victims. It doesn't work for society. And it's time to go. It's time to let that go. Nelson Mandela was once asked what he thought about political leaders, what he thought about politicians who supported the death penalty. And in his quiet, thoughtful way, he simply said, political leaders, politicians, who support capital punishment have just not fully evolved. My colleagues, I think today is a day that New Hampshire should fully evolve on the issue of capital punishment. I would hope that we could feel the spirit of amazing grace enter into this chamber and enter into our hearts. And I would hope we would have the ability, finally together, to see that New Hampshire can live without the death penalty. Please, I respectfully, humbly ask you, vote yes, vote the green button. Thank you. The question before the House is notwithstanding the governor's veto, shall HB 455 become law?